Live from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News R, India's voice to the world. I am Manil Thomas. Coming up in the next hour. India to remain global growth driver. India's economic growth is projected to remain strong. Campaigning for the first phase of India's general election comes to an end. Political leaders and parties make last-minute attempt to woo voters. UK warns Iran that Israel will retaliate. Germany calls on all stakeholders to avoid an unpredictable situation. Netanyahu reiterates Israel's position to defend itself. G7 and European Union leaders meet in Italy to discuss stepping up sanctions against Iran after Tehran's missile and drone attack on Israel. And Ram Naomi festival marking the birth of Lord Ram celebrated across India. Ayodhya witnesses celestial glory with sun rays falling on the forehead of Ram Lalla's idol. Well, the ongoing crisis in the Middle East is causing concern in the West with fears that it could escalate into a broader regional conflict. Tensions have been rising since the beginning of the Israel-Hamas armed conflict. Tensions have escalated significantly across the Middle East since Israel initiated its campaign in Gaza last October. This has led to a series of confrontations between Israel, its ally the United States and Iranian-aligned groups in various countries across the region. In a recent update, British Foreign Secretary David Cameron said that Israel had made a decision to respond to the Iranian drone and ballistic missile attack. The situation is very concerning. It's right to show solidarity with Israel. Uh, it's right to have made our views clear about what should happen next. But it's clear the Israelis are making a decision to act. We hope they do so in a way that does as little to escalate this uh, as possible and in a way that, as I said yesterday, is, is smart as well as tough. But the real need is to refocus back on Hamas, back on the hostages, back on getting the aid in, back on, back on getting a pause in the conflict in Gaza. Iran launched a barrage of missiles and explosive drones late on 13th April. Tehran justified these strikes as acts of self-defense following the bombing of its embassy compound in Syria's capital on April 1st. Meanwhile, Iran has issued a statement in which they have said its military was ready to confront any attack by Israel with the Air Force saying it was prepared for action. Iran's Navy commander said that it was escorting Iranian commercial vessels to the Red Sea. Speaking at an annual military parade on Wednesday, Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi warned of a severe and heavy response if Israel makes the slightest move. If the Zionist regime makes the slightest move to violate our territory and harm the national interests of the Islamic Republic, they must understand that they will face severe and heavy response. Iran launched more than 300 drones and missiles against Israel on April 13th, marking its first direct attack on the country. This retaliation came in response to an airstrike attributed to Israel on Iran's embassy compound in Damascus on April 11th. While the Iranian attack caused no deaths, it has heightened fears that the violence stemming from the six-month-old Gaza war is spreading. There is now an increased risk of open war between long-time adversaries Iran and Israel. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived at the U.S. Naval Support Activity Base in Naples on Wednesday ahead of the G7 Foreign Ministers Summit on Capri Island. The meeting will bring together the foreign ministers from Italy, Canada, France, Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, the United States and the European Union to discuss various political and economic issues. With Rahul Upadhyay, Tanvi Taneja for DD India. Well, DD India's Sarah Kuz joins us live from Tel Aviv. Good evening, 
Do you see this Gaza true stocks, you know, stumble with Israel clearly now ready to act against Iran? Well, certainly that's what we heard from the Qatari Prime Minister just a little earlier today. He said that there are stumbling blocks, that it's a very sensitive time, and that this is something that Qatar, one of the key mediators, is of course working to get over. But with regards to this Israeli response that we certainly can expect, sources close to Israel's war cabinet have come out to say that it will be painful and it will be strategic. Really, the only question marks that we are seeing right now is when this will happen and what it will look like. But it is quite likely that uh, when there is an attack by Israel on Iran or on Iranian proxies or interests, that what we may see is an attack against military assets because over the last few days since this unprecedented Iranian attack on Israel, Israel is now uh, finding a rare moment of international support once again. And of course, if Israel does anything to jeopardise that, such as uh, killing Iranian civilians, that would certainly uh, throw that into doubt. So uh, Israel, of course, as we've been hearing, as you heard there from Lord Cameron, who's visiting Jerusalem today, he's come out to say that he certainly expects an attack, but we just need to wait now and see actually what the Israeli war cabinet decides. Okay. Sarah, what will happen, uh, you know, when the Israeli army gets into Rafah 1? And, you know, what needs to be done to stop, you know, Middle East, especially from sliding into this unpredictable situation? We have been talking about this Rafa operation now for months. It's, of course, of great international concern, given that some uh, 1.3, 1.5 million internally displaced Palestinians are sheltering there. And it's, of course, an area that Israel had previously declared as a safe zone. Now, we do understand that the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, he's actually uh, given the OK for these operational plans. No date set yet as to when this would happen. Uh, we do know of course, though, that given this Iranian threat that took place a few days ago and then the subsequent attack, that this potential incursion into Rafah has now been put on the back burner. But in terms of a wider escalation, uh, this is certainly why we are seeing these foreign diplomats here today, the German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock and also uh, the British Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron. They are really uh, trying to bring tensions down, trying to prevent any further regional escalation, which of course could draw these key allies in. And this is uh, why we're seeing the timing potentially of these sanctions that we are expecting to be put on uh, Iran uh, announced because certainly if these sanctions are deemed great enough, enough to strangle Iran's uh, capabilities when it comes to missiles, when it comes to drones, then this could potentially be enough uh, to pull Israel back and sort of limit its response. So really uh, what we are looking at over the next few days is of course this Israeli response and uh, all of that will be dependent on where we go from there. Well, let's hope there is some light at the end of the tunnel there. Appreciate your joining us this evening on DD India News Hour. Well, moving forward, foreign ministers from the group of seven major democracies gathered on the island niche uh, on the Italian island of Capri on Wednesday for three days of talks, which is overshadowed by expectations of an Israeli retaliation against Iran for missile and drone attacks. The meeting is bringing together foreign ministers of the U.S., Italy, Canada. France, Germany, Japan, the UK and the European Union. Germany has said the delegation will also discuss support for a Ukrainian air defense system in its conflict with Russia. Well, DD India's Giles Gibson joins us live from Cape Re in Italy for the latest. In a good evening, uh, how do you see the G7 leaders? Are they on the same page, especially when it comes to sanctions, you know, that needs to be imposed at this point of time? Well, we've seen the G7 foreign ministers arriving here on the island of Capri. Because of the way this island works, it's a very kind of 
quirky island. They are driving up to a piazza in the heart of the island, and then they're having to get out of their cars and, and walk through the streets to the hotel just over my shoulder there where these talks are being held. We're seeing uh, helicopters circling overhead and security personnel on that roof behind me as these talks now get underway. In terms of where these foreign ministers are, in terms of what they're going to call for, in terms of that uh, conflict, that, those growing tensions between Israel and Iran, well, going into this meeting, we were expecting really that to be limited to simply a strong message, a united front from the G7 calling on Israel and Iran to de-escalate tensions and for tensions in the wider mi Middle East to also be de-escalated. But now there appears to be momentum building behind this idea of introducing some sorts of sanctions against Iran as uh, a response to those missile and drone attacks that were launched against Israeli territory over the weekend. That effort very much been led by uh, the US and the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken although European countries at this stage, it appears, seem to be more focused on introducing sanctions on individuals rather than as the U.S. is planning to do uh, on Iran's uh, missile and drone programs. Well, you know, the Middle East crisis is set to dominate. But do you see the possibility of China's role in assisting Russia, especially in the Ukraine crisis, be also brought on the table? Well, the Italian president of the G7, uh, the Italian presidency, hosting this meeting uh, is saying that there are going to be discussions over the course of the next couple of days about stability in the Indo-Pacific region. So that certainly will include the group's stance towards China as well as uh, its, its, its wider sort of uh, response to tensions on the Taiwan Strait, for example. But really, I think the, the sort of second item on the agenda just below uh, de-escalating tensions in the Middle East is going to be how the G7 responds to uh, the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. And we're going to see some pretty in-depth, some pretty technical discussions around these $300 billion of frozen Russian assets in the West. There's been an effort led very much by the US and, the, and Canada and the UK to push for at least the profits from those assets to be seized and handed over to the Ukrainian government to help their ongoing response to the Russian invasion. The Europeans, again, are understood to be a little bit more nervous around uh, that potentially setting some sort of a, a dangerous precedent. So over the next few days or so, we're going to see discussions on that, but we're not actually expecting a final decision to be made on, on how to use those assets uh, until we see uh, the Leaders' Summit, which is coming up, also hosted here in Italy uh, in June. We'll leave it there. Thank you. Appreciate you joining us. GD India's correspondent Giles Gibson there from Italy. Well, Dubai's international airport has been experiencing significant disruptions due to bad weather. The airport has advised passengers to avoid traveling to the airport unless absolutely necessary. They are working to restore normal operations soon. Flights have been delayed or diverted while some crews have been displaced. Airport officials stated that it would take some time to get operations back to normal. The United Arab Emirates has been hit by the heaviest rainfall ever recorded in the country, surpassing all data collected since 1949. I have never seen this rain, uh, yesterday's rain, like uh, it's everywhere it is flooded here. First time this kind of rain is happening in uh, Dubai, so it's very hard for people and public. We'll be joined by our Dubai correspondent there, uh, Vinod Kumar, for more updates on this particular story. Good evening. You know, flights hit, family stranded at the airport. What's the latest, especially when it comes to the situation on the ground? Uh, good evening, Anil. Uh, flooding affected most part of the UAE and uh, the heart of Dubai was also affected uh, by Dubai Mall and the Mall of Emirates resulting in angle deep water and uh, property damage. Uh, yesterday's rainfall evoke uh, memories of the tumultuous uh, rainfall that happened similarly in 1981. And this is not the first time in the last six months that's, uh, th that rain of this uh, type has been encountered in the UAE, not, if not this uh, scale. 
speaking about the airport uh, airport operations uh, the abu dhabi is the capital the capital of ua is abu dhabi the abu dhabi zaid international airport is fully functional and uh, from yesterday around 21 uh, flights from dubai has been diverted to abu dhabi and uh, uh, around 5 to 10 flight transport aircraft also been uh, di- diverted to abu dhabi airport and uh, dubai airport yes dubai airport is not fully functional uh, fly dubai fr- uh, uh, the the flight which is partially owned by the owner of um, emirates is has started its operations uh, uh, today afternoon and sharjah airport the flag carrier of the sharjah airport is air arabia they have announced the suspension of check in of all flights from sharjah international airport till uh, 2 am on april uh, 18 due to these adverse weather conditions okay and uh, speaking yeah you know a quick word especially when it comes to the reasons for this heavy rainfall in dubai and you know the gulf peninsula in particular we've seen a similar incident in oman to take place you know is there a broader fear especially when it comes to the gulf peninsula that uh, yes know, the, uh, the yes sir, this is actually this is actually a very significant question most of the news channels uh, uh, internet has been reporting that the cloud seeding which is done by the ua government is the reason for this kind of rainfall but actually this that is fake and that is a misinformation that is being circulated the real reason is due to a, a, due to a larger type of storm which was passing from the arabian sea upwards towards the north see uh, to understand this we have to understand the how ra- how rainfall occurs a rainfall occurs when uh warm and moist air carrying moisture rises upwards and as the moist air rises upwards due to the lapse rate the temperature decreases once the temperature decreases then there is a chance of convective currents that uh, can be formed in the upper the upper tro- troposphere and it can pour us rains here in this part of the uh, planet we do not have uh, uh, much geographic relief in india we have the geographic relief in times of western ghats vindhyas and satpuras here it is all dry deserts there are not much geographical relief so that's the reason why primarily here rain doesn't happen but this time what happened was that a cold air mass from the polar regions was descending and it was met, met by this storm type of uh, air mass which was carrying warm and moist humid uh, air so okay. when these type of two masses met obviously the cold air mass will not rise the hot air mass uh, rose and the uh, uh it it caused rain in the entire peninsula why this is not always happening most of the time this happens over the uh, gulf of oman or the wider arabian sea and indian ocean so we do not encounter these kind of phenomena in the land but this time it occurred over oman uae saudi arabia and qatar that is the reason why such uh, uh, such a large scale uh, rain uh, occurred in this part of the continent okay we'll leave it there thank you appreciate your joining us getting us those latest you know one of the worst weather especially in uae history we're going to track that story for you thank you appreciate you joining us still to come on dd india news hour well still to first seven jurors uh, are chosen for donald trump's hush money criminal trial with 11 more still needed Sixteen killed in Ukraine's Chernev in Russia's air strike in weeks And US President Joe Biden's administration intends to reimpose oil sanctions on Venezuela ending a 6 month reprieve Will the Israel Iran conflict blow up into a full blown war in West Asia or the Middle East Who killed the world's largest anaconda belly days after it was first discovered Watch Connecting the Dots every Friday at 8 p.m. IST or 14.30 GMT on DD India. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India.
You're watching DD India News R. I'm Anil Thomas. Let's now get you all the latest on the world's largest democratic elections in India. Well, Wednesday saw leaders of various political parties crisscross the country in the battle for uh, elections to India's lower house of parliament. Prime Minister addressed rallies in the east, while senior BJP leader Rajnath Singh was in Kerala. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi addressed a joint press conference with the Samajwadi Party Supremo Akhilesh Yadav in Ghaziabad in Uttar Pradesh. While in West Bengal, TMC released its manifesto for the parliamentary elections. Here's what unfolded across the day. With campaigning closing for the first phase of polls on Wednesday, leaders of various political parties intensified their campaign for the second and third phase of polls. Prime Minister was in the Indian state of Assam where he addressed a rally in Nalbari which falls under Barpeta parliamentary constituency. It goes to polls on the 7th of May. BJP Bo Party hai. जो सबका साथ सबका विकास के मंत्र पर चलती है एनडीए सरकार की योजनाओं में कोई भेदभाव नहीं होता उनका लाभ हर किसी को मिलता है अब एनडीए ने ठाना है कि देश के हर नागरिक तक पहुंचकर जिस सुविधा का वो पात्र है वो सुविधा उसे दी जाएगी इंडिया डिफेंस मिनिस्टर एंड सीनियर बीजेपी लीडर राजनाथ सिंह वॉज इन सदर्न स्टेट ऑफ केरला वेर यू एड्रेस पब्लिक रैलीज इन कासरगोड वडकरा एंड कन्नूर केरला गोज टू पोल्स ऑन अप्रैल 26 सिक्स टू इलेक्ट ट्वेंटी मेंबर्स ऑफ पार्लियामेंट 2014 में हमारा यह भारत इकोनॉमी की साइज में दुनिया में एलेवेंथ पोजीशन पर खड़ा था 2023 में ही हमारा भारत दुनिया की टॉप फाइव कंट्रीज में आकर खड़ा हो गया है 2047 आते आते हमारा यह भारत दुनिया की डेवलप्ड कंट्री के रूप में खड़ा हो जाए In Karnataka, Goa Chief Minister Dr. Pramod Sawant held a road show in Belgavi. The state will go to polls in two phases on April 26th and May 7th for the general election. Congress leader Rahul Gandhi addressed a public meeting in Mandya and Kolar in Karnataka. He was joined by Congress President Mallikarjun Kharge in Kolar. I learned a lot about politics from my grandmother. She said once to me, Rahul the leader only has one job and one technique all the leader has to do is search carefully for unfairness in uttar pradesh congress leader rahul gandhi and samajwadi party chief akhilesh yadav were in ghaziabad to support congress's ghaziabad candidate the two leaders also held a joint press conference the ghaziabad constituency goes to polls on april 26th mujhe khushi hai is baat ki कि आज कांग्रेस पार्टी के नेता राहुल गांधी जी और समाजवादी पार्टी की आज हम मिलकर के प्रेस कर रहे हैं कांग्रेस जनरल सेक्रेटरी प्रियंका गांधी वाड्रा हेल्ड अ रोड शो इन सहारनपुर इन द इंडियन स्टेट ऑफ उत्तर प्रदेश इन वेस्ट बंगाल ऑल इंडिया तृणमूल कांग्रेस रिलीज इट्स मैनिफेस्टो फॉर दी अपकमिंग पार्लियामेंट्री इलेक्शन In Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir, senior BJP leader and Union Minister Dr. Jitendra Singh held a road show in Kalibari in Katwa district. Fuzail Ahmed's report for DD India. Well, in a unique and one of its kind outreach, India's Prime Minister wrote a letter to all BJP and NDA candidates fighting elections in the first phase. In a letter to Tamil Nadu BJP chief K R Namalai, Prime Minister wrote, and I quote. With the blessings of the people, I am confident that you will reach the parliament. Team members like you are a great asset for me. As a team, we will leave no stone unturned for the welfare of the people of the constituency and the country. Through this letter, 
I would like to tell the people of your constituency that this is not an ordinary election. Families across India, especially the senior members, would remember the difficulties they have gone through in the five to six decades of Congress rule. In the last 10 years, the quality of life of every section of society has improved with many of the troubles removed. Yet, a lot more is still to be done and this election will be decisive in our mission to ensure a better life for everyone. This election is an opportunity to connect our present with a bright future. Every vote that the BJP gets will go towards forming a stable government and impart momentum in our journey to become a developed nation by 2047. Well, joined by our correspondents there on the ground, uh, you know, taking these uh, discussions forward. We've got Shishir Shelar joining us uh, from the Nagpur region in Maharashtra. We've got Tapash Bhattacharya joining us from Kohima, the capital of Nagaland. And we've got Siddharth Bharadwa joining us from Dehradun to take this uh, discussion forward. Let me first come to you, Tapas. You know, looking at the Northeast and, you know, the entire Northeast, especially going or completing polls in the first phase, and now that we have hit the pause button when it comes to campaign, you know, how do you see the political dust settle down? This way that, uh, you know, in comparison to other parts of the country, they're not as vocal or as loud as you might want them to be, but they're very silent. They know what they want. And when we talk to them, they don't want to come out, uh, you know, with, the, with their views, who they want to vote for. But uh, one thing is for sure, they, there are certain points that they are very clear about, uh, especially when it comes to the development plan, the infrastructure development, the uh, development of educational institution, hospitals. All these are very high on their list and uh, they will vote uh, based on those parts. Also, uh, Nagaland and the near about areas, these, these areas uh, have ethnic tribes, they, they're mostly... Uh, you know, consists of ethnic tribes and uh, they have their own uh, system in place so uh, they do uh, you know keep those things in mind whether uh, the, the 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 candidates will uh, take forward their uh, the, their uh, way of life the, the for instance in nagaland the naga way of life whether they will be uh, able to take uh, you know uh, make their voice heard in the lok but those are the points that they uh, talk about and uh, those are the uh, things that uh, they will be weighing in while they cast their vote on 19th of this particular month. Okay, Siddharth, looking at Uttarakhand that goes to polls in a single phase, you know, which is that five seats, there are five seats there, which is, you know, one interesting political battle that you see unfold, you know, as the election campaign comes to an end. Well, uh, a very good evening to you, uh, Anil, first of all. Uh, and, you know, all the five seats are very interesting here in the state of Uttarakhand. But one which I see is the Haridwar constituency, where the fierce battle is between the two political parties, which is the Congress and the BJP. And from uh, the BJP side, uh, Trivendra Singh Rawat is contesting the elections, whereas uh, from the Congress side, uh, 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 Harish Rawat's son uh, is contesting the Virindra elections. Rawat. You know, the battle is fierce between both the political parties. All, uh, all row. Although, uh, you know, the, the, the competition is fierce, like I said, and, uh, uh, you know, although the, 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 the state of Haridwar constituency has a major stronghold of BJP, uh, but this time around people are saying uh, that, you know, anything can happen because, you know, people have become more aware. They just want to vote for the development, although people in the region... Uh, is very happy with the fact that what is what the, whatever the government is doing is very good, but they want something more with these elections coming. And additionally, uh, with the youth and the first time voters shipping in is making this this election is very unique because you know through the social media and through all the awareness campaigns launched by the Election Commission of India and all the youth organizations, people here in the region are very, very excited to go to the polls on April 19. However, from today, the campaigning has been completely stopped. Door-to-door -door campaign will begin, but then uh, where else no other form of campaign is allowed, uh, you know, as according to the model code of conduct. So people here have now decided on whom to vote, although political parties are trying their level best uh, to woo the voters, but people... Uh, of this region know that whom to vote and they are very excited like I said these elections uh, uh, have brought in something unique and new uh, uh, with it Lok Sabha polls 2024 uh, when I had a word with the residents here 
you know when i when i when i asked actually uh, you know what what are your issues so uh, they are saying like i said that they are very happy with the way the government is okay. functioning but they want more okay uh, they know, want they more want is better what health systems they want better education system okay they want more uh, especially from the people who are there uh, you know their representatives elected uh, to parliament let's shift focus to the west of india shishir joining us from nagpur you know that goes to polls in the first phase the nagpur the vidarbha belt the 10 the five seats from the 10 in the vidarbha region going to polls uh shishir there has been a lot of churning especially in the regional forces the ncp the shiv sena you know now that we've seen the first phase you know as it unfolds do you see the people have too much on their plate when it comes to choosing you will absolutely uh, anil at this point in time even though the campaign cannon has completely stopped here but obviously all the contenders uh, have tried everything to convince the voters star campaigners war was also uh, you no know, in the in the battle here and they have also taken many rallies here now it's in hand of the voters exactly what they want to uh, you know uh, they want to decide and obviously on 19th we'll see the fate of most of the contenders will be deciding now you rightly said here uh, in maharashtra particularly uh, there is a lot of in the plate for the voters to decide obviously Uh, earlier there was only few party but in recent time come uh, no if you if we talk about uh, in last two years uh, the party has also been increased there have been faction in the parties and now uh, again we have seen the same leaders along with the new faces have coming in uh, to the you know election battle here and that's the reason uh, we can say it's quite a tough uh, task for the political parties but quite easy task for the or probably we can say that uh, uh, you know uh, choose various options to choose uh, from uh, especially for the voters and here in maharashtra if you look at them uh, the choices are very different even though in a larger scale we'll see that only two camp are fighting against each other that is nda and uh, no uh, the india alliance but uh, no uh, there are six parties actually in the fray hmm. uh, and that's the reason when it comes to seat sharing uh, formulas also and selecting the candidate also it's not a it's not a easy task for all these political parties so people are enjoying here obviously because they got a good option but at the same time they are also looking quite carefully that what are their issues okay. and who's going to represent that and how these leaders if suppose they choose any one of them how these leaders are going to know raise their voice in the parliament and that's reason people are quite choosy in maharashtra but obviously difficult task for the political parties but uh, an absolute uh, delight for all the voters well an absolute delight for the voters i'm going to take that line from you the campaigning camp cannon has stopped i'm going to thank all three reporters there on the field you know uh, i'm going to ask you to be there with us regularly especially giving us those updates but you know great job there i'll ask you all to stay hydrated you are in that hot summer enjoy that political battle there but keep yourself hydrated and safe as you cover elections for us from ground zero well moving forward staying with elections but once again dipping further down to south karnataka that goes to polls in two phases on april 26th and may 7th for the general elections bangalore rural lok sabha constituency is a politically complex constituency this constituency will see kpcc president that's dk shiv kumar's brother suresh face stiff competition from dr manjunath the son in law of hd devagoda the jds supremo and former prime minister aisha has the details Bangalore rural Lok Sabha seat was formed after delimitation and it consists of comprising of 8 assembly seats Kunigal Anekal Magadi Ramnagaram Kanakpura Chennapatna and Rajarajeshwari Nagar DK Suresh is the only MP from Congress who won this Lok Sabha seat for Congress in 2019 the BJP JDS alliance now target to wrest back the seat from the DK brothers since it was earlier held by kumar swami and his father devagoda hence party has fielded devagoda's son in law dr c n manjunath a renowned and popular cardiologist the congress dismisses dr manjunath as a white collar politician but he is giving a tough time to dk suresh the constituency is known for world famous chennapatna wooden toys which made their way to the white house too 
If your destination is Mysore, you will never miss the bright colored wooden toys here at Chenpatna. This is the land of toys which is world famous for its wooden toys. And these toys have gained popularity ever since Prime Minister Narendra Modi encouraged the skilled laborers here and he gifted these wooden toys to the American president on his visit to India. And since then, people have uh, been curious about uh, Chenpatna toys and any time you pass by Chanpatna uh, road highway or uh, the main road of Chanpatna, you will never miss these colorful toys. These are all uh, toys which are organic, but in Chanpatna, the electoral politics is not a child's play. And this time, the elections here are a very tough battle, not only for the sitting MP, uh, D.K. Uh, Suresh, but also uh, for uh, the BJP uh, candidate uh, Dr. C. N. Manjunath. So during the campaign here, we see uh, uh, the battle of words and uh, the BJP going all out to make inroads in Chenpatna. Now, Chenpatna is part of the old Mysore region and this is part of the constituency of Bangalore rural uh, Lok Sabha seat. So, BJP's aim is to make good uh, imprints in uh, Chenpatna and uh, win as many seats as possible. So, Amit Shah has been working hard in this uh, region and especially in Chenpatna, he has been uh, campaigning. So, it will be an interesting battle to see how the alliance uh, of BJP and JDS will work because the JDS has its influence in this region because of the caste factor and this will be an interesting uh, strength added uh, to the BJP's uh, uh, efforts to win uh, to win uh, this Lok Sabha seat. So this uh, town is going to see an interesting battle and the old Mysore region is yet another getting ready to witness a historic battle in Bangalore rural with cameraman Muni Krishna Aisha Khanam, DD India, Chanpatna. Well, five seats in the Upper Assam region are going to polls on the 19th of April and the last day of campaigning for the political parties. They used their full might to the voters. But the Jorhat is going to witness a tough battle between the BJP and the Congress. Here's a special report by DD India's correspondent, Dibendu Mondal. Political parties in the Upper Assam region, which goes to polls on the 19th of April, are giving a last push to Wu voters. Both the BJP and the Congress carried out rallies across the Jorhat constituency on Wednesday. In this Jorhat seat, Congress's deputy leader in parliament taking on BJP's Topon Gogoi. This seat, locals say, will witness a tough contest between the two candidates as they both belong to the Ahom community, which dominates this region. BJP leader and Chief Minister of Assam, Himanto Biswa Sarma, carried out a massive roadshow in the Sip Sagar region of Jorhat constituency. This BJP's campaign on the last day is being looked at as a crucial push for Topon Gogoi to win from this difficult seat. People in Shib Sagar are mostly a home. In this election, the two candidates are Gaurav Gogoi and Tapan Gogoi. Both are in competition here. The Sib Sagar region of the Jorhat constituency, which is dominated by the Ahoms, was the seat of power of the Ahom dynasty. The remains of the Ahom dynasty's palaces speak volumes of the influence it held. These have now become a major tourist attraction which brings tourists to the Jorhat region not just from Assam but also from different parts of the country, generating employment for many. Locals also express happiness about the schemes they received from the BJP government. During the time of COVID-19, the government gave me money to open a canteen. I am happy, I am earning a livelihood by myself now with this help, got every facility from the government here, got a house too. I am hoping the BJP will win from here. The battle for the five seats in the Upper Assam region is coming to a close. Here in the Jorhat parliamentary constituency, the BJP will test its fate against the Congress's Gaurav Gogoi. But... It is the people of Jorhat that will seal the fate of the candidate that will go to Delhi in India. With Campus and Jagmohan Pradhan, this is Dibyendu Mondal from Jorhat in Assam for DD India.
Well, still to come on DD India News R. India to remain global growth driver. India's economic growth projected to remain strong. We'll be discussing this with our experts. Will the Israel Iran conflict blow up? into a full-blown war in West Asia or the Middle East. Who killed the world's largest anaconda many days after it was first discovered? Watch Connecting the Dots every Friday at 8 p.m. IST or 14.30 GMT on DD India. You're watching DD India News R. I'm Adil Thomas. Well, a UN report suggests that India's economy will grow by 6.5% in 2024. The report says that multinationals extending their manufacturing process into the country to diversify their supply chains will have a positive impact on exports, which will be a key factor for the growth of Indian economy. Here's a detailed report. The surging Indian economy is projected to grow by 6.5% in 2024, according to a report by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. The factors expected to support growth in India in 2024 are multinationals extending their manufacturing processes into the country to diversify their supply chains, which will have a positive impact on Indian exports. India grew by 6.7% in 2023 and is expected to expand by 6.5% in 2024 continuing to be the fastest growing major economy in the world. The expansion in 2023 was driven by strong public investment outlays, as well as the vitality of the services sector, which benefited from robust local demand for consumer services and firm external demand for the country's business services exports. The Reserve Bank of India is expected to keep interest rates constant in the near term, while restrained public consumption spending will be offset by strong public investment expenditures. Last week also, Anktad released a report which said that investment in South Asia, particularly India, remains strong and India is benefited from growing interest from multinationals which see the country as an alternative manufacturing base in the context of developed economies' supply chain diversification strategies. However, the economic growth in other South Asian countries remains more subdued. Bangladesh, Pakistan and Sri Lanka are currently under IMF programs, the conditionalities of which necessitate the application of tight monetary policies and fiscal austerity measures. As per the report, global growth has been projected to be 2.6% in 2024, slightly slower than the 2.7% in 2023. This makes 2024 the third consecutive year in which the global economy will grow slower than before the pandemic. Against this backdrop, India's robust economic growth clearly indicates that the day is not far when India will be the third largest economy of the world. Bureau Report, DD India. Well, we're joined by our guest to take that uh, thought forward, Sachin Chaturvedi, uh, eminent uh, economist and DGRI is joining us this evening to take it forward. India continues to perform above expectations. Do you see this 6.5% percent projections that we have got you know to be a conservative estimate vis-a-vis -vis rbi which says we are showing a seven plus growth rate absolutely right uh, if you see rbi projection of seven percent and the 6.5 percent that uh, untard report today talks about and if you see last week's imf report uh, which had placed it around 6.8 percent the factors that all the three agencies, the Reserve Bank of India, uh, the IMF and the UNCTAD, all the three have uh, analyzed, they largely come on uh, four broad areas. Uh, uh, though the outcomes are different, but uh, uh, the reasons that they have identified for such high growth, I think, are all extremely similar and converging. First and foremost is huge push for manufacturing, for job creation, but also for uh, providing additional emphasis in terms of uh, uh, operationalizing the PLI scheme that we launched. Uh, the second uh, factor is in terms of fiscal prudence and continued focus on capital expenditure, particularly on infrastructure. Third, and I think which has emerged extremely uh, well in last uh, four years, 
is in terms of tight monetary policy and its close coordination with fiscal policy. Okay. And that has given its due uh, results. Uh, the, the fourth and the last is in terms of how we are looking at uh, issues in terms of R&D push. So India is now largely being led by startups and uh, the new push uh, for research and development. Okay, Mr. Chaturvedi. These are all well realized. Okay, Mr. Chaturvedi, to what extent is India driving growth, especially in South Asia and Southeast Asia? See, most of our uh, neighboring countries, be that uh, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, they all are going through transition. Mm -hmm. They all would be graduating from LDC status to developing country status. The crisis in uh, Sri Lanka is very well known to us. We saw how India's G20 presidency emphasized in terms of solution going beyond the usual global debt mechanisms that were available within the G20 framework. India leveraged and Sri Lanka was supported not only by India but by many other international entities including IMF. So what you find in the region is a growing requirement for resources trade and investment linkages, and also new technologies for digital transactions. India is going forward to support and partner with our neighboring countries in all of these areas. Okay, you know, stock markets at an all-time high, gold reserves, you know, growing in value. You've got the forex reserves also high. In that context, how, you know, how should India go about choosing markets, you know, these markets? You know, first of all, with a Global South perspective too, I would like, you know, answer that short and brief. Uh, Ma, uh, if you see Anil, Ma, what yesterday happened and how over the weekend the crisis that we saw between uh, Iran and Israel, that is uh, still a source of worry for most of us. Though, as you rightly said, gold reserves have gone up, bond yields are, are, are impressive, the global markets are struggling. And we are also, in a way, watching the situation for crude oil prices that may come as a shock. So we are all extremely concerned in terms of how uh, that would pan out. But given the fact that domestic economy led by huge and very strong domestic demand, we are seeing possibility of uh, the growth trajectory that RBI and other entities have projected to come up as a reality. We'll leave it there. Thank you and appreciate you joining us. Uh, Sachin Tatulvedi, uh, you know, taking, uh, projecting how India looks a bright spot, especially uh, for investing and also as a market. Appreciate you joining us on DD India News Hour. Well, shifting focus to international news, former U.S. President Donald Trump's hush money trial is underway as the selection process continues to choose a panel of 12 members and six alternates who can be fair to the former U.S. President. The first seven jurors were selected on Tuesday to serve in Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial. Michael Cohen, who once said he would take a bullet for Donald Trump, is now poised to serve as a prosecution witness in the future. Trump spoke against the judge overseeing his New York criminal trial, repeatedly calling him conflicted and saying he should not be there. Amidst the ongoing Russia-Ukraine armed conflict, three Russian missiles struck the center of Cherniv, a city in northern Ukraine near the Russian border on Wednesday, resulting in the death of at least 16 people with dozens more wounded and significant damage to civilian buildings, according to officials. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky called on Kyiv's allies to rush in air defense support. The Biden administration has indicated its readiness to reimpose oil sanctions on Venezuela on Thursday, citing President Nicolas Maduro's failure to uphold commitments for free and fair elections. The U.S. is unlikely to renew a six-month license as provided partial sanctions relief to Venezuela since October following an election agreement between the government and the opposition. Biscuit Jatra is an eight-day celebration that culminated on Wednesday with a huge celebration in the district of Bhaktapur in neighboring Nepal. Thousands of people gathered in Bhaktapur Darbar Square to witness the celebration. In a tug of war, people pulled an unequal number of ropes which were biased towards the forward direction. A tug of war took place during the Jatra to determine to which half of the city the chariot would go first.
Ram Navmi celebrates the incarnation of Lord Vishnu, who took birth as Lord Ram in prehistoric city of Ayodhya. This year, the festivals, the festivities got even more special since they were the first such auspicious event at the newly built Ram Temple in Ayodhya. Prime Minister said he was overwhelmed as he watched the Surya Tilak ceremony virtually. DD India's Mihir Makuri puts the day's meaning into context. On Wednesday, Hindus worldwide celebrated Ram Navami, a day commemorating the birth of Lord Ram. Not only in India, but all across the globe. The joyous occasion observed on the ninth day of Chaitra also marks the culmination of Chaitra Navratri. The day symbolizes the significance of adhering to the righteous path advocated by Lord Ram, emphasizing values such as courage, compassion and devotion. On the festival, India's President Draupadi Murmu extended a heartfelt greetings to the countrymen and said that the festival gives us the message of following the path of truth. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi also extended greetings on the festival to the countrymen and mentioned that his heart is overwhelmed and fulfilled. In Ayodhya's newly built Ram Temple, which stands at Lord Ram's birthplace, worshippers thronged in large numbers to catch a glimpse of the deity. This year, the auspicious occasion was made even more special by the Surya Tilak ceremony of Ram Lalla, wherein the sun's rays fell directly on the deity's forehead at noon. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi also shared a glimpse of himself, virtually witnessing the Surya Tilak ceremony of Ram Lalla, mentioning that it was a deeply emotional moment for him. On Ram Navmi, Sudarshan Patnaik, the renowned sand artist, Hailing from Odisha, unveiled a breathtaking sand sculpture depicting Lord Ram. Down south, faithful celebrated Ram and Abhmi at Bengaluru's Kodanda Ramaswamy Temple by offering prayers to Lord Ram. From elaborate temple rituals to colorful processions, Ram and Abhmi festivities paint the towns and cities with vibrant hues of devotion and celebration. It's a time when traditions are upheld with fervor and prayers resonate in every corner. Moreover, Ram Navmi underscores the importance of service and charity. It inspires acts of kindness and compassion towards the less fortunate, echoing Lord Ram's message of empathy and benevolence. Mihir Makuri's report, DD India. Well, that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour, but let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. For those on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates from India and across the world on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms. Scan the QR code on the screen to download now. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I am Anil Thomas from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India. News hour.